So welcome to week one of Writing in the Sciences. My name is Kristen Sinani. I'm a clinical assistant professor at Stanford University, where I teach, uh, in addition to scientific writing, I also teach uh, statistics. In this first week, I want to start with a little bit of an introduction, and then I'm going to just jump right into some key principles of effective writing that we're going to be talking about over the next couple of weeks. So just to start with, I'm going to do a little introduction. And uh, some of the goals that I have for you for this course is that I'm hoping to get you to rethink your writing process a little bit, maybe rethink your approach to writing, and I'm also helping to ease some fears that you may have around writing. So I'm hoping to do a little bit of that in this module. So in my course at Stanford, I always like to start by asking students the question, what makes good writing? And feel free to discuss this on uh, the discussion format later, uh, but for now I'm going to kind of tell you what I think makes good writing. So first and foremost, what I think makes good writing is that good writing needs to communicate an idea clearly and effectively. And this is even more important in scientific writing because the whole point of scientific writing is to get your ideas across, get your results across to uh, other scientists, to policymakers, and sometimes even to the lay public. So it's really all about getting your idea across clearly and effectively. All right, well, there's also this other element, the second element of good writing, right? This is really what everybody associates with good writing. Good writing is, is beautiful. It's elegant and stylish, right? And I think what actually happens when a lot of people sit down to write is they're worried about, about two up there. They're worried about sounding a certain way. They're worried about sounding smart or sounding elegant. And they spend so much time focusing on number two that they forget about just trying to get their idea across clearly and effectively. And that leads to all sorts of problems in the writing. So I really want you in this course to keep your focus on that the main point of writing is to get your idea across clearly and effectively. I want you to worry less about that elegant and stylish part. Because that first part, clear and effective writing, that really just takes having something to say, which as a scientist with results you, you have, and it takes clear and logical thinking. It's very important to get your arguments across in a clear and logical way. But I think as scientists, probably all of us feel that we have that. We have something to say. We have clear thinking. So that step uh, you know, about good writing is a little bit less intimidating, I think, to most people. Now, this elegant and stylish part is actually fairly intimidating. But that actually happens through re revision. So Elegant and stylish writing doesn't happen on a first draft, even for professional writers. And I'm going to show you some examples in this course. That elegant and stylish piece really comes in through revision, through taking time to go back and rework your first draft. And also, oftentimes, a lot of professional writing that you see when you read a magazine or a novel, that's been through some good editing. And that's really polished that writing. So that elegant and stylish part happens on revision. So I don't need want you to even worry about it when you're writing your first draft. Just aim for getting that idea across in a clear and logical way. So I also always like to ask the question to my students, what is it that makes a good writer? And I think a lot of things get associated with good writers. Um, I'm going to give you a few of what I think uh, people associate with good writers. So I think a lot of people think that in order to be a good writer, you've got to have some kind of inborn talent. And a lot of scientists feel that they weren't born with the writing gene. They were born with the math gene or the, the science gene. But they don't feel they have that kind of inborn talent. Or you might think it takes years of English and humanities classes to become a good writer. And again, a lot of scientists don't have that. Or maybe you think it takes some kind of artistic nature. Or many people think maybe it takes the influence of alcohol and drugs. Or maybe some kind of divine inspiration, some kind of muse. So all of these things get associated. A lot of people think you need these to be a good writer. But in fact, I don't think you need any of these to be a good writer. So I think what it takes to be a good writer is one, again, you have to have something to say. You have to have something that you're passionate about that you want to communicate. And uh, that sounds a little bit trivial, but I can't tell you how many times I've had a student, I've been doing editing with a student, I'll have the student come to my office and we go over the edits and I'll say, oh, I got to this paragraph, I was a little confused by what you meant. Can you tell me what you were trying to say? And they'll kind of look at me and go, well, I'm not really sure what I was trying to say in that paragraph. They don't know. And that's why it's a confusing paragraph, why I can't understand it, because they weren't really sure what they were trying to say. So you have to have something to say. You have to know what you're trying to get across. You need logical and clear thinking. You have to be able to present your arguments in a logical way, particularly in scientific writing. 
But again, I think most scientists really feel very comfortable that they have both of those. They have something to say and they have logical thinking. What you might not have yet is you may not know a few simple learnable rules of style. And these are the tools that I can teach you in this class. Surprisingly, you may not have ever been taught these before. In fact, in some cases, you may have been taught the opposite. So, uh, in fact, though, these are fairly simple rules that I can teach you. They're easy to learn. And once you learn them, it'll be a lot easier for you to write in a clear and effective and efficient way. So one of the take-home messages I have for this course is that good writing can be learned. Good writing is a skill. You don't have to be born with it. You can learn it, and as with any skill, you learn it through practice. So here's some things you can do to help improve your writing. Besides taking this course, here's a few things to, to do. So, uh, so reading is a really good way to learn to be a better writer is if you read. And read sources of professional good writing like magazines, novels, uh, uh, nonfiction books, not necessarily the scientific literature. So you're actually your first assignment for this course is I'm going to force you to find some time to pick up something that to read that you wouldn't have had time to read otherwise. So make some time to read something, even if it's just a magazine. Read it. Pay attention to how professional writers uh, write. Pay attention to some of the tricks they use, some of the tricks we're going to learn in this class, and imitate. So do as much reading as you can outside of the scientific literature while you're taking this course. If you have time, uh, as I said, writing is a skill, so the more you practice, the better you're going to get at it. So if you have a little time at the end of each day, or the beginning of each day, try to write in a journal. It could be an old-fashioned journal or an electronic journal. Try to spend a few minutes just practicing some of the techniques that we're going to talk about in this course. I want you to let go of some academic writing habits, some bad habits that you may have picked up by being in academia too long. I call this the deprogramming step. So I'm going to tell you uh, some things that you may have been told, you know, that you weren't allowed to do before, or you may have picked up some bad habits. I'm going to try to break you of those. A really good tip uh, before you sit down to write about your, uh, your research is try to talk it out with somebody, even just a friend who's not necessarily in your discipline. Because oftentimes when we talk about our research, we do it in a more conversational tone. We talk in more simple terms. We actually present our ideas better than when we sit down to write. So often talking about your research can help. Um, one of the things I'm really, really going to emphasize in this course is that I want you to actively try, when you sit down to write your manuscript, to actively try not to bore your reader. And that may sound very funny, but we are all in the same boat here because we all have to read the scientific literature. You've probably all had the experience where you've got the stack of scientific papers that you've got to read, they're sitting on your desk, and you're just kind of dreading reading them because you know they're going to be tedious and hard to get through and dull. And the scientific literature doesn't have to be that way. We can write it in a more engaging and lively and interesting way. So I really want you to actively think about when you're writing, trying to make your writing engaging and trying not to bore your audience. That would be great, right, if the scientific literature was as fun to read as a magazine or a book. Another thing I hear from a lot of students is, I can only write when I'm inspired. So they kind of have this notion that they can only write on certain days if the moon is lined up a certain way. Uh, of course, this is just a procrastination technique. You don't need any special muse or inspiration to be able to write. You do need to be prepared to write, and that's something we're going to talk about in the writing process, but you don't need inspiration. So just kind of get over that notion that you have to be inspired. Except that writing is hard for everyone, so it's really helpful, I think, if you realize that even for pro professional writers who do this every day, there's just something inherently difficult about the task of writing. So if you find writing hard, you're in the same boat as everybody else. So I think knowing that can just help to reduce some of the anxiety that you may have around writing. Also in this course, I'm going to try to give you a lot of tips to help make your writing easier. There are a lot of ways that you can ease the writing process, you can make it easier for yourself. So those are the, some of the kinds of things that I'm going to be talking about in this course. But it's nice to know that everybody's in the same boat, right? Writing is really hard for everyone. It's just a very challenging type of task. I'm also going to really emphasize revision in this course. So a lot of scientists don't spend enough time on revision. They, they really worry over the first draft. They try to get it perfect on the first draft, and they don't give enough emphasis and enough weight to revision. So I'm going to try to get you to flip that and really kind of just 
Go through the first draft quickly, get it down on the paper, and then put your emphasis on revision. It's an easier and more efficient way to write. And really, again, the elegance in writing happens on revision, not on the first draft. I'm going to try to teach you how to cut ruthlessly in this course. It's really hard to cut your own uh, work. It's easier to cut other people's work, and we'll do some of that in, in this course as well. But you can't become too attached to your words. You have to learn how to be a ruthless editor. And I am a ruthless editor, so I warn you, if you ever send me something to edit, I am very ruthless. And in fact, um, you know, sometimes people will send me something like an abstract, and they'll say, well, it's 250 words, it needs to be less than 200, can you help me? So I take that as a challenge, and I'll send it back to them at 150 words, you know. So uh, learn how to cut, it will really improve your writing. We're going to talk a lot about cutting clutter from your work this uh, first week of the course. Uh, if you can, find a good editor, somebody who can edit your work. And, and sometimes a spouse, a friend, a significant other, if they're willing, can be a good editor. Somebody outside of your discipline who can look at your work and give you some uh, feedback, tell you whether it's written at a level that they can understand, tell you where it's confusing, if it's boring. So uh, you might actually in this course, we're going to be doing some peer editing, you might actually meet uh, some, other of your, some other scientists who are willing to edit your work. And if you get a good editing relationship going with somebody through this course, they could be a long-term editor and you could edit each other's work reciprocally. So try to find a good editor. And then finally, the last thing I'm going to emphasize in this course is I really want you to start taking risks in your writing. So sometimes the scientific literature, you know, when you're sitting down to write scientific academic writing, it's really, really confining. You're kind of forced in this little box. You're told there are all these rules you don't dare break. And it really kind of, you know, boxes you in. It doesn't let, let you find your own voice as a writer. So I'm going to tell you that some of these things you've been told that you can't do in the past, like use a dash or write the word we, that it's actually okay to use the word we or I, to, to use a dash. So I'm going to encourage you to take some risks, to get out of that little box and try to find your own voice as a writer. You know, go ahead and put something in your writing that's a little bit funny. Put something that's provocative. So I really want you to take some risks and find your voice as a writer. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University please visit us at med.stanford.edu.